On the 17th of September, 1894, the naval fleets of China and Japan fought a battle at the mouth of the Yalu River. In five hours of fighting, China's Beiyang fleet lost five capital ships and suffered over a thousand men killed or wounded. Japan now controlled the Yellow Sea. Before the war, the Chinese Navy had been ranked eighth in the world, and the Japanese only 11th. China's Navy had also been considered the most powerful in the Far East. The rout of the Beiyang fleet in the Battle of the Yalu River and its subsequent annihilation in Wei Highway, its home port, shattered the illusions of the Qing rulers. The westernization movement's 30-year effort to strengthen China and increase its prosperity had ended in failure. On the 17th of April, 1895, Viceroy Li Hongzheng signed the humiliating Treaty of Shimonoseki on behalf of China. Taiwan, the Penku Islands, and the Aodong Peninsula were all ceded to Japan, and China was to pay reparations of 200 million taels of silver. When news of the treaty's terms reached Taiwan, the islanders were overcome with grief. They lamented their misfortune for days and nights on end. The governor of Taiwan, Tan Jing Sung, sent several telegrams to the prime minister in Beijing, urging the Qing government not to surrender Taiwan. He warned that his people would rather die than yield to Japan. However, for the Qing government, the safety of the capital came first. It replied by telegram that the Taiwan population should leave within two years or adopt Japanese dress. This telegram enraged the people of Taipei, who protested by shutting down their businesses. They vowed, we would rather die fighting than hand over our homeland. Governor Tang and other patriotic officials, such as Chu Fengjia, decided to resist the government order and defend Taiwan on their own. Chinese Namazi 最后一招让我们自己自治 One week later, on the 2nd of June, the government dispatched Li Hongzheng's son, Li Jingfeng, to complete the handover. Li boarded the Saikyo Maru off the Taiwan port of Jilung to sign the transfer document, together with the newly appointed Japanese Governor General, Kawayama Sukunori. People in the cities of Taipei, Jianghua, and Tainan fought bravely against the Japanese army in a series of battles, but lost. Taiwan fell into Japanese hands. In spring 1895, the triennial imperial examination was about to be held in Beijing. Thousands of candidates arrived from all over China, among them 37-year-old Kang Youwei and his student, Liang Chao. They had both passed the Guangdong Provincial Civil Service exam. Kang and Liang were as shocked as the rest of the nation by the Treaty of Shimonoseki. On the 22nd of April, they organized a meeting and drafted a long petition at Songjiang Temple in Beijing. It protested at the Qing Emperor's acceptance of the treaty and pleaded with him to fight rather than capitulate. It called on him to move the capital out of reach of the Japanese and begin political reforms. 
The petition was signed by a thousand examination candidates from 18 provinces. The petition came too late to be effective against the treaty, but together with petitions from officials at every level, it had a tremendous influence in China, inspiring the Gongche Shangshu reform movement, which took its name from the protesting scholars. Kang Yo Wei had a history of pressing for reform, and the chief examiner, Xu Tong, would have liked to fail him. But Kang passed the examination by cloaking his opinions in traditional literary language. Placed 46th in the examination, he was appointed as the sixth ranking officer in charge in the Ministry of Construction. Though disappointed not to have reached the more influential Hanlin Academy, Kang remained determined to keep writing to the Emperor. Magwantio 第三个讲社会上的，我们讲中国现代化的起点，我们可以追溯到明末，对吧？都来，也可以追溯到一八四零年的鸦片战争。但是真正表明一个现代中国的发生，最根本的标志，要有一个新阶级。这个新阶级是
the Viceroy of Jolie. Some gave Li his detailed proposals to strengthen China by making the best use of its people, land, resources, and markets. Li, preoccupied by the war, ignored the proposals. Sun was forced to give up any hope of helping the Qing government. He decided that to transform China, Qing rule must be overthrown. That November, he returned to Hawaii. There, with the help of his brother, Sun Mei, he set up the revolutionary Revive China Society. Its members were pledged to expel the Tata barbarians, revive China, and establish a unified government. So, all in the same year, Kang Yo Wei and Yang Si Chao launched their reform movement, Lu Hao Dong designed his blue sky flag for the revolutionaries, and the Revive China Society began plotting a revolt in Guangzhou. But word of the plot got out, and the revolt was aborted. Lu Haodong was beheaded, and the government put Sun Yat-sen on the wanted list. He later recalled how, at this time, the entire nation despised him and his comrades as traitors and usurpers. They were widely condemned. It was clear that violent revolution was unacceptable to much of Chinese society. This convinced Kang Yu Wei that the only way to improve China would be peaceful reform under Qing rule. Kang Yu Wei and Yang Si Chao established the Society for National Strengthening with branches in both Beijing and Shanghai. The organization won support from government ministers such as Sun Jia Din, Wung Tong He, and Zhang Jia Dong. There were also some British and American supporters. Even the opportunistic general Yuan Shikai was a member. At this time, Yan Fu, a graduate of the Fuzhou Naval Academy, translated T. H. Huxley's Evolution and Ethics, which introduced the Darwinian concept of the survival of the fittest into China. And in 1897, the liberal-minded governor of Hunan, Chun Baojun, set up a modern school in Changsha. His activities helped make Hunan one of the most open, progressive provinces in China. Within a few years of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, the shock it delivered led to practical action. Kang Yu Wei submitted eight proposals to the Guangxu Emperor, recommending that he start a systematic program of reform following the examples of Peter the Great of Russia and the Meiji Emperor of Japan. It was a last opportunity for the Qing rulers to reverse the decline of the nation, but only if they were quick to implement the necessary political reform. The Guangxu Emperor had ascended the throne in 1875 at the age of four. Although he began to hold court at 17, military and administrative powers had remained in the hands of his aunt, the Empress Dowager Zhe Xi. Now in the spring of 1898, China was at risk of being annexed piecemeal by foreign powers. The emperor made it clear to Zhe Xi that he refused to lead a collapsed nation. Unless she permitted him to carry out reforms, he would rather abdicate. So she responded by giving him tacit consent. On the 11th of June, 1898, the Guangxu Emperor issued a Statement on National Affairs, an edict that signaled the beginning of reform. 
Five days later, in the Renshou Hall of the Summer Palace, the young emperor finally gave an audience to Kang Youwei, who was now a famous reformer. Kang gave the emperor a systematic explanation of his views on reform. The meeting between the ruler and his subject lasted for two hours from 5 to 7 a.m. As soon as the meeting finished, Kang Youwei was appointed as an advisor to the prime minister. The new position allowed Kang to be close to the emperor and to become a trusted minister himself. The summer of 1898 was unbearably hot. Nevertheless, the Guangxu Emperor traveled more than 12 times from the Forbidden City to the Summer Palace to meet with the Dowager Sir Qi, whose approval he still needed to implement his reforms. During what is known as the Hundred Days Reform, almost 50 imperial decrees were issued. But they met strong resistance from high-ranking court and provincial officials. Only a few, such as Hunan Governor Chen Bao Jin, responded positively. The Ministry of Rights and Education, for instance, strongly opposed the abolition of the eight-part essay format in the imperial examinations. The retrenchments of staff from abolished institutions made every official uneasy. The measures caused panic in the ruling group, and opposition began to gather around Sir Xi. By the time the Guangxu Emperor had promoted reformers like Yang Rui, Ya Guangdi, Lin Xu, and Tan Zetong to help him read proposals and draft important decrees, the officers of court and prime minister really existed in name only. The large, sophisticated bureaucracy at the heart of the court was badly shaken by the advent of the young officials. As the reforms progressed, Empress Dowager Sashi took note of the more radical measures and instinctively felt that the reforms were a plot to seize power from her. The Guangxu Emperor's reform attempt to save the Qing monarchy turned into a power struggle between him and his aunt. In early September, the Emperor dismissed the Minister of Rights and Education and six other officials who had resisted the reforms. This intensified his conflict with the Empress Dowager. Prince Ronglu, a general, demanded that Sir Xi should act to stop the Emperor and his reforms. All this while, the imperial powers still lay firmly in the hands of the faction headed by Empress Dowager Sir Xi. The court officials and the eunuchs were quick to notice the split between her and the Emperor. The eunuchs, always good at seeing which way the wind was blowing, began to make public appeals to Sir Xi to receive the government and take back power from the emperor, even though he was now an adult. On the 18th of September, amidst rumors that Sir Xi would displace Guangxu, Prince Ronglu moved his troops into Beijing. Tan Tung saw the danger to the reformers, including the emperor, and went to seek help from another general, the commander of the new army, Yuan Shikai. Tan did not expect that Yuan Shikai would reveal their conversation to Ronglu. Three days later, on the 21st, Sashi returned to the Forbidden City and resumed her regency. Soon afterwards, all documents related to reform were confiscated. The Guangxu Emperor was forced to sign arrest warrants for those who had assisted him. Kang Youwei found protection at the British legation and fled to Hong Kong. With help from the Japanese legation, Yang Si Chao escaped to Japan. But Tan Tse Tung and five others chose to remain. On the 28th of September, all six were executed. They are remembered as the six gentlemen of the Hundred Days Reform. Meanwhile, Sir Xi held a ceremony in the Forbidden City's Qingjiang Hall, accepting congratulations from her officials. 
豪庭的高层发生过两次垂帘听政，第一次发生在这个光绪幼年即位的时候，那个时候以正宫慈安太后和西宫慈禧太后两人共同垂帘。当时的客观情况是光绪年幼，那么他当了皇帝以后，暂时不能行使这个行政处理的权利。那么第二次垂帘听政就是戊戌变法失败以后。光绪皇帝已经成年，戊戌维新以后，光绪皇帝被排除出权力中心之外，慈禧集团走到这个帝国政治的前台来，这个在当时的士大夫中，呃，引起了很大的这个反响。Sun Yat-sen, now in exile in Yokohama in Japan, had his queue cut off to show his determination to break with Qing rule. He had already been wearing Western dress since 1895. When Sun arrived in London in October 1896, his former medical school teacher, Dr. James Cantley, arranged for him to stay at Gray's Inn in Holborn. On the morning of the 11th of October, Sun was on his way to accompany the Cantleys to church, when he was lured to the Chinese legation by a diplomat, Dung Ting Kun. Who had trailed him ever since he arrived in London? Sun was locked in a small room with iron bars. For the head of the legation, Gong Zhao Yuan, Sun was a big catch. He and Councillor Marga Li conspired to send Sun back to China and collect a generous reward. The two had leased a 2,000-ton British ship at a cost of 7,000 pounds. They had had a timber cage specially made to hold Sun while he was on board. The imprisoned Sun Yat-sen tried throwing message slips from his window down to the street outside, hoping to attract the attention of passers-by, but no one noticed. Eventually, Sun was able to speak to an English cleaner at the legation, and asked him to pass a message to Dr. Cantley. Cantley tried and failed to get any help from Scotland Yard, so he appealed to the British Foreign Office. On the 22nd of October, a London newspaper, The Globe, published an article headlined "Startling Story: Conspirator Kidnapped in London, Imprisonment at the Chinese Embassy." The news stirred up London public opinion. The British Foreign Secretary expressed his concern and pressed the legation to release Sun Yat-sen. The silver lining with this incident was that it brought Sun overnight fame. After his release, Sun remained in England for another nine months. He spent much of that time at the British Museum, studying politics, diplomacy, law, military affairs, and economic theory. Through this broad reading, he gradually developed his own view of an ideal society, one without the industrial disputes and strikes he saw in Western countries. He refined his ideas into the three principles of the people. They were the principles of nationalism, democracy, and welfare. His followers adopted them as a revolutionary nation-building program. Kang Youwei and Yang Zichao were setting up a monarchist party in Japan after the suppression of the Hundred Days Reform. Sun Yat-sen traveled to Japan from London, hoping to patch up his dispute with Kang and Yang. But as an advisor to the emperor, Kang felt it was beneath him to deal with someone he considered a traitor. Their mutual friend Inukai Tsuyoshi tried to make peace between the two men, and arranged for them to meet. But Kang Youwei didn't show up. In the Wu Shi Changes, the Chinese society has two reactions. 就是这个上层精英阶层，因为他们通过内部进行改良，这个途径已经被堵塞了。六君子的被杀和这维新派的这个被禁锢的打击，使得上层呃寻求呃改良的这个想法
呃没有送到的这个途径。另外一个列强。侵略导致的这个不平等条约，给中国带来经济上程度的负担，加上自然灾害、天灾人祸，底层老百姓的这个生计也受到了非常大的影响。The Boxers were a secret society active in Shandong, Henan, and south of the Yangtze River. As Western missionary activities became widespread, conflicts between Christians and other Chinese became more and more frequent, and loose organizations of local people. Began to target foreigners and foreign things. In 1899, Yu Xian, the governor of Shandong, acknowledged the boxers and gave them his approval. The dowager Sir Chi also realized that she could use the boxers against foreigners, whom she resented for supporting the Guangxu Emperor and his reforms. Encouraged, the boxer rebels began to burn churches. And the homes of foreigners, they killed missionaries, and dug up the graves of missionaries who had died in China. They even murdered the German imperial envoy, Baron von Kettler. On the 21st of June 1900, the Qing government itself declared war on the foreign powers. Fighting alongside the Boxer rebels, the Qing army besieged the legation quarter in Beijing. In August, troops from Britain, France, Russia, Japan, Germany, America, Italy, and Austria landed at Tianjin and made for Beijing. So she fled the capital, taking the Guangxu Emperor with her. On her way west, she ordered the suppression of the Boxer Rebellion. The episode ended with the Qing government signing the Boxer Protocol, which left China in the hands of the colonial powers. 义和团运动也是以慈禧为首的清朝官僚集团在绞杀戊戌变法之后的第一件政绩工程。这场运动将中国完全陷入殖民主义的深渊。八国联军这场离奇的这个战争，引起的全民的愤怒，使得慈禧集团第一次感受到来自中外上下各个阶层的压力。长期以来隐蔽在后宫、行使权力的慈禧。习惯于将功劳归于自己，而把挫折和失败都归于政府和大臣。被晒在阳光下的慈禧集团，不得不开始思考两年前他们亲自绞杀的那场清朝的自我改良运动。In January 1901, the Qing government issued a decree from its exile in Xi'an, ordering local governments to submit reform plans within two months. But highly placed court officials knew that Sir Shi herself remained reluctant to discuss Western-style laws. Zhang Zhidong, the governor of Hunan and Hubei, and Liu Kunyi, the governor of Guangdong and Guangxi, worked for several months on a plan that became known as the Three Joint Memorials on Reform. Based on their recommendations, Sir Shi began reforms similar to the ones she had opposed in 1898. The new Secretary of Enactment, Shen Jiabin, put the legal system on the reform agenda, and opened a reform-oriented department in 1904. It mainly translated and studied foreign laws while codifying China's own legal history. New policies included allowing intermarriage between Manchus and Han, abolishing foot binding, and a new education system that did away with the imperial examinations. In November 1908, Guang Shu and Sir Shi died in quick succession. The reforms they left unfinished were taken up by Guang Shu's half brother, Prince Sai Fung. He tried to establish a constitutional monarchy. But could not avoid Manchu domination. When the new cabinet was announced in May 1911, it consisted of eight Manchus, one Mongolian, and only four Han. Of the Manchu members, five were of royal blood. The cabinet was mocked as an obviously imperial one. 1908, the Qing government, the Guangxi government, issued the Qing Ministry of Reform. 清廷宪法大纲呢，就开始是一个宪政的架构，就对皇帝的权利开始有所限制，就是限制皇帝权利，就是就什么设一个议会
分享他的一点权利。另外设一个责任政府，就责任政府说，就皇上慢慢把这个政府把这个每年处理这种政务事情交给一个一个职业团队去打理，但是人民不满意。因为原来在双轨体制下，内阁成员当中的部长们，满大臣、汉大臣，那不汉人出身的，我占一个，你的满人占一个，我也占一个。那过去是六个部当中有十二个大臣，汉人有六个吗？那么现在这次改革之后呢，是十个部，加上一个总理、两个副总理，这十三个人，九个是来自于满洲贵族和皇室，汉人。只剩下几个，只剩下四个。By delaying and obstructing the emergence of a truly reformed constitution and political system, the Qing monarchy was sounding its own death knell. More and more people joined the anti-Qing revolutionary movement. Chinese students in Japan launched newspapers and periodicals such as People's Voice and China in the 20th century. Some others returned to China to start tabloid papers like Subao Press and Alarm Bell. Essays such as Sou Rong's Revolutionary Army attracted more young people. Meanwhile, Sun Yat-sen traveled around Japan, Honolulu, and the continental United States, seeking support from overseas Chinese. In Honolulu, he joined the Chinese Hongmun Society in order to win over sympathizers with the monarchy. As more and more revolutionary organizations mushroomed, Sun began to entertain the idea of establishing a united political party. In August 1905, Sun, together with his comrades Wang Xing and Song Jiao Ren, set up the United League in Japan with over 70 founding members. The goals of the new organization were to expel the Tatar barbarians, revive China. Establish a republic, and distribute land equally among the people. Sun was excited and declared that from that day forward, they were no longer subjects of the Qing Empire. The United League took the lead in the anti-Qing movement, with the periodical People's Voice as its official organ. In the very first issue, Sun introduced his theory of the three principles of the people. 九四年十一月份，孙中山一起就提出了口号，就是“驱逐大陆，恢复中华”，就这样。那么，等到一八一九零五年，从新中会改为这个，结合什么华华新会、光复会，几个合起来推到孙中山同盟会的时候，在东京八月份成立同盟会的时候，这个时候使这个使这个口号更完整了，“驱逐大陆，恢复中华，创建民国”。那么这样呢，它使这个同盟会的这种主张呢就更完整，但是它基本上可以概括出什么呢？就是到这个时候，孙中山的主导思想就形成了，就是三民主义嘛，就民主、民生、民权的三民主义，就基本上在这在这过程当中就形成了。中华民族这个概念是梁启超提出来的，一九零一年提出来的，但是这个概念真正成为一个国人能够接受的时候呢？是一个非常微妙的一个转折过程，就是辛亥革命之后的一刹那。On the 9th of May, 1911, the Qing government suddenly decided to nationalize two railway lines, one from Guangdong to Hubei, and the other from Sichuan to Hubei. The news shocked the merchants of Sichuan, who had heavily invested in the project. On the 24th of August. 10,000 people gathered in Chengdu, threatening strikes in schools and businesses, and declaring that they would stop paying tax. Yet, even as they protested against the government, they still revered the late Guangxu Emperor. The Qing government ordered the Sichuan governor Jia Efeng to crack down on the protest. On the 7th of September, 12 leaders, including Pu Di and Zhu. And Luo Lun were arrested. When the crowd tried to present a petition in front of the governor's house, Zhao, who was already known as Zhao the Butcher, ordered his troops to open fire. In no time, a mass of people fell to the sound of guns.
Most of the dead were poor, from the lowest rung of society. Their deaths were ostentatiously ignored. For three days, Jar forbade anyone to bury the corpses. The rain poured down and the bodies grew bloated in the puddles. The scene was horrendous. Jar's brutality enraged the people of Sichuan. Two hundred thousand people from all over Sichuan province assembled and surrounded Chengdu. On the 10th of October, 1911, when the new army was sent to support Zhao Efeng in Sichuan, some soldiers of the engineering battalion and artillery battalion revolted and occupied the governor's house. Overnight, the rebellious soldiers captured Wu Chang. By the 12th of October, they had also occupied three towns in Wuhan. At the time of the Wuchang uprising, Sun Yat-sen was fundraising in Denver, Colorado. He did not know what had happened until he saw it in a newspaper. He longed to return to China. However, he had diplomatic issues to deal with. Knowing that the revolutionary cause needed British support, he went to London, hoping he could persuade the British government to stop all loan negotiations with the Qing government. Sun Yat-sen finally arrived in Shanghai on Christmas Day, 1911. Four days later, he received 16 valid votes out of 17 as a temporary president of the Republic of China. The new republic started from the 1st of January 1912 with Nanjing as its capital. In the face of a national uprising and provincial separations, the Qing government put up a last-ditch struggle by appointing Yuan Shikai as prime minister. Since Yuan Shikai controlled the new army, the Republican government decided to negotiate with him for fear of a civil war. Sun Yat-sen resigned and recommended that Yuan Shikai be the president of the Republic of China, provided that he accepted the abolition of imperial rule and supported the cabinet-based republic. After Yuan Shikai reached an agreement with the imperial family that it was to receive preferential treatment, the Qing Emperor officially gave up the throne. The imperial edict of the abdication of the Qing Emperor was endorsed by Empress Dowager Longyu on the 12th of February, 1912. It read, A revolution has spread throughout China. When a majority of the Chinese people aspire to a republic, it must be the mandate of heaven for us to obey. We hereby hand over the imperial power on behalf of the emperor. We hereby announce acceptance of a constitutional republic system. We hope to see a great Republic of China with territorial integrity under which the Manchu, Mongolian, Han, Hui and Tibetan peoples are united. With the publication of this edict, the 268-year-old Qing dynasty came to an end. At the same time, China bade farewell to the last dictatorial monarchy in its history. Hari in 1793, the first British envoy to China, Lord George McCartney, commented perceptively 
after a frustrating meeting with the Qianlong Emperor. He wrote in his journal, The Empire of China is an old, crazy, first-rate man of war, which a fortunate succession of able and vigilant officers have contrived to keep afloat for these 150 years past, and to overawe their neighbors merely by her bulk and appearance. But whenever an insufficient man happens to have the command on deck, due to the discipline and safety of the ship, she may perhaps not sink outright, she may drift some time as a wreck, and will then be dashed to pieces on the shore. But she can never be rebuilt on the old bottom. 120 years after McCartney's prophecy, the old ship of the Qing dynasty finally fell to pieces. McCartney foresaw that China could not avoid being included among the world's nation states that had been formed in the course of modern history. If reform did not happen from the top, a revolution from the bottom would turn the nation upside down. With the end of Qing rule, the Chinese people began to pursue a republic and democracy.